if there's a broken gene, you know there's a mutation that's correlated with the thing that you're looking for. So that was the game of human genetics in the 1980s. And I'm going to tell you a story of breast cancer in just a minute. But think about it. That's not what we're doing these days with genomics, right? All these studies that you're reading about in the paper are people who are, all the studies are looking for millions of human variations. And they're looking at diseases like diabetes, cancer, heart disease, high blood pressure, uh, who's going to get lung cancer if they smoke, who isn't. These are just kind of any disease anywhere. And we're scanning the whole genome for all the variations that we know about in a single experiment. And we're doing huge population correlations. But we are not looking for single broken genes anymore. What we're looking for is associations between genetic predisposition and clinical outcome. That's a complete sea change that's happened, but that's where we are now. The tools that we have are basically tools that were developed out of the Human Genome Project in order to be able to find very common variations between human beings. So these are variations that were taken. You take a huge population of people and you say, let's find all the places on the chromosomes where there are differences among these people. Those are markers. Those are ways of telling which piece of DNA was inherited from which person. Those are the, 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 and, the and what we've done is we've identified all those variations. We put those DNA segments on chips. And that's what we do our experiments with. So why is that a limitation? That's a limitation because that's there are 3 billion base pairs in the human genome. And on one of these experiments, we're only looking for about a million variations. So we're only capturing a very, very, very small fraction of all the information that's embedded in the human genome when we do these experiments. Where are we headed? We're headed towards being able to derive each one of our sequences from our genomes in a day, 15 minutes, at a cost of maybe $100 within five years or so. Um, huge, huge change. Now, why does that matter? It matters because it's a much, much higher level of resolution of what's going on in the human genome. And almost everything that I'm going to tell you is going to be changed in a very revolutionary way by that technical capacity. So the way I'm going to get us there is I'm going to walk us through um, how the, the, the breast cancer story played out. And then I'm going to um, walk us through where we are now very briefly and then shift to what's happening in the world of what's being called personal genomics, which is about to make a, a new transformation into full sequence genomics. So here we are. We've got the heroine of breast cancer. This is Mary Claire King on the right here. Um, Mary Claire King. Um, did exactly the strategy I was talking about for Alzheimer's disease. She had faith that at least in some families, breast cancer was associated with an inheritance of susceptibility genes. That is, if you get a gene, you're much more likely to get breast cancer than if you aren't. She was looking for sub, she was looking for, she was collecting families that had very high likelihood of having multiple people with breast cancer and it turned out that it overlaid with ovarian cancer and some other cancers. Um, so this was somewhat counterintuitive, but in 1990 she found the first linkage between breast cancer in some families and chromosome 17, a per particular region on chromosome 17. That set off a horse race that involved her lab um, and the laboratory of uh, this guy. Um, this is a guy named Mark Skolnick. And across from him, this guy right here, is um, my former boss, uh, James Watson, the, the Watson of Watson and Crick, um, who discovered the double helical structure of DNA. Um, the race was uh, it involved six or seven teams all over the world. But Mary Claire King was the head of one of the teams, and uh, Mark Skolnick here was the head of one of the other teams. They originally collaborated together. Uh, that didn't last very long. And 
as this race was starting off, a new company was forming in Salt Lake City, Utah, called Myriad Genetics. It was co-founded by Mark Skolnick and uh, Walter Gilbert, one of the co-inventors of the uh, one of the sequencing techniques, DNA sequencing techniques. And they decided to focus their resources on finding the breast cancer gene that uh, was involved in these families that Mary Claire King was studying. Um, at that time, it was becoming clear that it was going to be possible to make diagnoses of people who were at risk of breast cancer. So in the field of bioethics, what, what were we worried about? What were, what were those of us who were following this story concerned about at the policy level? Well, one, we were worried about uh, what's going to happen when you know that you're at higher risk of getting breast cancer. Are you going to be able to get health insurance? In the United States, this is a big deal. Um, this doesn't have quite the same edge up here north of the border. Um, although it does still have some edge to it in connection with life insurance, disability insurance, and other kinds of insurance. Um, in the U.S., though, it's a very big deal uh, for health insurance. Um, we just passed, after 13 years of effort, we just passed the bill last May. Uh, it was just signed into law last May, a, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act that uh, prohibits genetic discrimination in health insurance and employment. Um, and it will go into effect later this year um, and will begin to phase in over the next year and a half after that. Um, we were worried about privacy and confidentiality. So you have information about your risk. Are you obligated to share that with other family members, uh, with your health insurance company, with your job, um, et cetera? And what are the people that know that information in the records, what are they obligated to do to protect relay of that information to third parties, confidentiality. Um, there was concern that in particular because uh, it turned out that Myriad Genetics won the race for finding the mutation for BRCA1 and it was kind of a race to the finish. It was a, a, a he, he won, she won um, for the second breast cancer gene, BRCA2. Um, it was published in Nature one day, but the patent application was filed by Myriad the day before that in Europe um, by Myriad. So uh, there's still dispute to this day about who exactly should have won that one race and who actually won that race, and I'm not sure that we will ever know for sure. Um, but um, in part because the race was won by Myriad Genetics, there was concern, okay, we've got a company that's now got a really strong financial incentive to make sure that everybody on the planet gets tested for breast cancer. That means too many people are going to get this test, right? So there was a, a great concern about overutilization of the breast cancer testing um, because of the financial incentives. And in bioethics, the notions that became popular in the late 1980s and into the 1990s were a right not to know something and the idea that some of this knowledge was toxic. Um, that is, it was so scary to know that you were a high risk of breast cancer that many people would want to not know that and that in fact they might uh, suffer devastating psychological consequences from learning that their risk was at 70% or 80% of getting breast cancer rather than 8 or 9% in the normal population. And then, of course, we were worried about cost of testing and access to that testing. So those, those were the policy concerns that we were worried about at the time. Now, I'm going to flash forward before I go back again to, uh, to, to, to finish up part of the, uh, the, the classic uh, genetic story. Where are we now? Well, the concerns now are more about now that this is working its way, these technologies are being used we're studying lots of people's DNA, um, and the kinds of DNA testing that's going on now in the population is as likely to be for ancestry or paternity testing, or um, testing through one of the companies that I'm going to be talking about in a minute, which is we don't quite know why people are doing this. In fact, the people who are doing it may not quite know why they're doing it, um, but it's out there, and it's not that expensive and you can get stuff and you can talk about it at cocktail parties. Um, and we're doing a lot of it. And it was absolutely, it was, this was the technology of the year for Time Magazine two years ago. That's kind of where we are. It's part of our culture now. Um, and this is interesting. So we have a new technology. We're doing lots of genetic testing. We've adapted the system of counseling people about what to do with this information. You can actually now get 
You can call up.